is one of the many pieces that I have prepared from this wonderful class and feeling so very secure with Mitch Levenberg's critiquing and encouragement. And I call this piece Soroya's Song. It was an old-fashioned bistro, unadorned and bare, just tables and chairs, a bar and a bartender attending, with wooden floors and indirect lighting. It originated before World War II, was refurbished afterwards, and remained an attraction for a sophisticated and knowing audience on the beaten side of the railroad tracks hidden near the Paris waterfront. I remember seeing her this special memorable night shortly after she and her partner Andre had split up. And what a night it was. When the curtains opened, she was sitting on top of a piano with only a pianist as accompaniment. It was time standing still, perhaps suitable to the early 1930s, before the evil of fascism took hold and the horrors that followed. She was American-born of Algerian Jewish French extraction. Her father and uncles were acknowledged heroes who had fought with the French underground against the Nazi German occupation. As a girl, she fantasized about going to France and decided to try living out her dream when in her early 20s. Gifted as a singer and composer, her talents enabled her to financially remain. She called herself Soroya, but her real name was Sarah Marchand. She was odd looking. One could conjecture that she was out of proportion, seemingly all legs, which were indeed unusually long and shapely, but her torso was long too and sinuous. She was not typically beautiful, but beautiful she was, carrying the appearance of an ancient proud people, a Semitic olive-complexioned beauty with high cheekbones, large, almond-shaped, deep brown, almost black eyes, and full mouth, and oh so dramatically, dramatically looking. She wore a slinky black long-sleeved dress which followed the movement of her slender, curvaceous, expressly graceful body, for which she willfully stayed hungry most of the time, wearing very high black heels and long crystal chandelier earrings, which reflected light glistening as she moved. Her long black curly hair was piled high on her head, and in her left hand she held a crystal glass blue bird, a love bird, she called it, which became her persona. Her voice was intimate, soft, and sultry, singing into the mic, but depending on her passion, it would change to round and full as she commanded. She was definitely another kind of a bird, a woman bird, and although she resembled a cat somewhat, she sang like a bird. Her audience would immediately applaud the as the floodlights focused upon her with the simultaneous opening of the curtains before she began to sing and long afterwards. Smitten, everyone loved the lovebird. She was the rage of all Paris. But on this night, when she sang, her eyes dropped many tears for it was the end of a well-known long love affair and partnership, and the songs she composed with Andre were written with her tears. So she was on center stage, alone, Andre no longer at the piano. 
but a stranger and said, so the lovebird was freed. So it appeared to fly from her cage and fly she had and fly she must and fly she will. Andre had done that for her and his jealous rages were gone, finished. He too was freed, but her cage became her song. She would sing as never before, and the price for her artistry and fame would be the lonely songstress's path, a true, pure love affair between her music and her audience. I saved her opening song, which was featured on the program presented called Blue Love, which she sang and composed. It goes. I hold my bluebird in hand, a lovebird, as I am, for love is the color of blue, the lonely and the betrayed. And only you will understand what cannot be forgotten, my seeking only to find the emptiness of the end and to be abandoned by another. And here am I, the curtains have unfolded, what my heart feels and will tell to quell my pain and my rage to sing for you. And oh, how the audience applauded, shouting, Bravo, sing, Soroya, encore, encore, bravo. You are the one and only lovebird. Sing your blue love. We adore you and love you always. We are with you. Go on, sing your songs to us. And she did, as no other. The first one is called, When One Door Closes, The Other Door Opens. I decided to leave the book club of which I was a member because it no longer met my needs. However, I was taking an art class at the book museum with two of my friends. At the end of each class, we headed toward the cafeteria to have our usual brunch. Suddenly, one member of the class approached us and asked if we would like to become a member of an interracial book club that met at Ethical Cultural Society at Prospect Park West. I decided to give it a try. I had known something vaguely about this group and asked my son what he knew. He responded that it was an altruistic group. So on the last Monday of October 2017, I visited this group headed by Susan who had invited me. She explained that this book club was an outgrowth of a large group at the center known as Lucy's Children. Lucy's remains in Africa were discovered by archaeologists and was known as the first original find of humanity. She also stated that we are all Lucy's children and had a common bond. This book club endeavors to promote racial and ethnic harmony and focuses on justice. At this session there were five white women, one white man, a black woman, and myself in attendance. Another black woman and two white women were absent. The book they had chosen to read was The Ways of White Folk by Langston Hughes, a collection of short stories. The story that created the most interest was the last one, Father and Son, which depicted the conflict between a white father and his mixed race son who wants to be treated equally. The next month's choice was Between the World and Me by Ta Nahisi Coates. It included a segment in which a black boy from a well-known home, well-to-do home is shot to death for no apparent reason. One of the participants in the group responded that things have changed drastically since the civil rights enactment. Other respondents replied that black boys are still being killed daily for no apparent reason other than the color of their skin. I added that I live in a middle-class neighborhood, Prospect Leopard's Garden, 
which was undergoing ethnic change when my family moved there in 1974. My 13-year-old son had reached out home with his house keys when he inserted at the door his keys when two white police officers with their guns drawn followed him. Fortunately, I was at the front door when I saw the officers and I asked, what seems to be the matter? They mumbled and walked away. My son was in the same situation as the boy in between you and me. The book club members that they wanted to read books about racial injustice so that they could be sensitized to this situation. It was evident that they were unaware of the oppression that black folks face daily, even though it is seen on television and read in the newspapers. Another activity of ethical culture was a newcomer's supper to which I was invited and accepted. This group included persons of various nationalities and religious groups. I learned of the many civic activities in which they were involved, such as immigration and other topics. I was invited to attend their services on Sundays, which are followed by lunch and discussions led by different leaders. I look forward to attending these meetings in the future. Our next choice was Family by J. California Cooper, which depicts the strength of a black enslaved woman core who in an after-death experience looks after and guides her daughter always through oppressive times. Cora, like her own mother, kills her slave master and herself that rather than be subjected by rape by two generations of owners. There are scenes of violence against both men and women. Always son is able to escape this situation because he can blend in and pass for white. The next book was The Color of Water by James McBride, a must read, which I had read before. The white woman, mother of black children, had the same ideals and dreams for her children that all mothers have. She faced reality and insisted that her children not attend black segregated schools, which were inferior. She reinforced the knowledge that black students have to work harder than their counterparts. Hers was an incredible story and journey. Our group decided they wanted to read literature by George James Baldwin. I mentioned this to Mitch, our writing professor, and he recommended the story, Sonny's Lose, a short story in the book entitled Going to Meet the Man. Sonny's heritage speaks to the concept of secondhand citizenship and the heritage that is passed down from generation to generation. Sonny's family is filled with rage. His father witnesses rather run down and killed by white men for no apparent reason. I can't wait for the next meeting to discuss, discuss this book. <coughs> On Monday, April 2nd, 2018, I read an article in the New York Times entitled, A New Black American Dream by Deneen Milner. In this article, she states that things will not be better for her children. She writes, I'm learning that the chances they will end off better than me are slim, and in fact they're in danger of being sucked back into poverty. One of the men in our group stated that even the building in New York City's school system Separate is not equal. Although the dollar amount may be the same for each child, black students need more material, resources, small class ratio, counseling, etc. In addition, in white schools, there are fundraising opportunities that increase the per capita funds for each child. I look forward to examining these poignant issues in future meetings. The next piece I'm reading, I'm so happy that Matt, that um, Mitch did include one of our former students, and here's her picture. She was a member of this group, her name was Cynthia Eileen Kerr, and I'll read about this beautiful person. I think I better drink some water first. I'm having a lot of congestion.
No, I, I'm fine with the water. Thank you so much. <laughs> I am not an avid television viewer. However, one Sunday evening with nothing else to do, I scroll the channel to find something interesting. The program that caught my eye was entitled Black Ballerinas. I thought I knew the plot of this program, thinking that it was about Misty Copeland, the first African American woman to be named a principal dancer in the 75 years of the American Ballet Theater. No, it was not about her. It was about other lesser known, notable black ballerinas who had four daring steps to enter this forbidden world. Historically, ballerinas are depicted as being life, petite, and blonde. This stereotype permeates our society today. Being buxom and muscular are not attributes that are considered worthy of being beautiful. It is the Aryan concept of superiority that prevails. People of darker complexion are still frowned upon. Our president, Donald Trump, says our country should be encouraging persons from Nordic countries to come to the United States since they are a tribute to the improvement of our nation. Unfortunately, Mr. Trump does not heed Dr. Martin Luther King's words that we should not be judged not by the color of our skin, but rather by the content of our character. The women highlighted in this documentary, Black Ballerinas, came up from a variety of economic backgrounds. They held the same dreams of all Americans to be judged by their ability. They came from families that stressed excellence in education. They were similar to the unsung heroines and hidden figures. These women made vast contributions to the advancement of the space age because of their excellence in mathematics. One of these living figures was honored by President Obama by receiving a medal. Fortunately, all of the women in this documentary, documentary Black Ballerinas, are still alive to tell their story, which they aptly did on television, which is truly a reality show. The cast included the heroines themselves. They are Joan Myers Brown, founder of Feladoma, a contemporary black dance group. Dolores Brown, former member of the New York Negro Ballet. Ashley Murphy, dance theater of Harlem. Amanda Smith, dancer. Raven Wilkinson, the first African American with the ballet de Rus de Palo, and a young woman from Georgia, Bianca Fabre, who is still struggling to get a job as a ballerina and now is working as a flight attendant. Many of these ballerinas travel abroad to join European dance groups. This is similar, similar to the experiences of black authors, actors, and actresses who were accepted abroad, but not in their own country. It was my good fortune to have met Arthur Mill, the founder of the Dance Theater of Harlem in the late 1970s. As a parent, I wanted my daughter to be introduced to the art, such as piano and dancing. I did not see her as a future ballerina, but as one whose character could be enhanced through exposure to the arts. Therefore, I and a group of mothers carpooled from Brooklyn to Harlem to enroll our daughters in the school. This went well for a few years. Then one day, a woman who was not of African American background came to evaluate the dancers. I thought she came to evaluate the student's dancing ability. I was wrong. She came to measure the dimensions of their physique. My daughter, although a size eight, was eliminated. Unfortunately, the standards of beauty and performance in our country still hold complexion and physical attributes as standards of beauty. But thankfully, we have Misty Copeland and others who have paved the way for other dollars. As I stated earlier in this paper, I am not an average television viewer, but I was fortunate enough to view a program that's set in Orlando entitled Come Dance With Me. This program depicted physically challenged children paired with professional ballet dancers. 
indicating the bridge to inclusion. And there are other unsung heroines. Sometimes they are in our midst and we do not see them. Last month I received a telephone call from Faye Keratitis informing me that her sister Cynthia had passed away. She said that my phone number was found among Cynthia's papers. Unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to know Cynthia well. Sometimes I took accessories home. In addition, when we took uh, mass transit, our motor transportation did not coincide. We took different buses to our home. We did not stop to talk. I did not wish to linger in the downtown area because it often becomes dark after 5 p.m. But since his sister told me something interesting about Cynthia, she and her whole family were proud of her. Cynthia was a self-made scholar. She had been a librarian in Jamaica. She found her way to Toronto to further her education. Her sister said she did this all on her own. She became a published author and won an award for writing. It is no wonder that she had such a rich vocabulary as was expressed in her poetry writing on so many varied topics such as politics, sports, etc. At her going home ceremony, I learned as well that Cynthia was a very unassuming person. However, the minister remarked that after retirement, Cynthia became a member of the Wednesday Ministry. It was in this setting that she shined and took over in a leadership position. Little do we know about our unsung powers. Ah, my piece is called my visit to a deaf cafe. Recently, I decided to attend a deaf cafe. When my husband died and was buried at Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, I noticed a posting for this event. I was planning to attend, but when I called, the attendance was already filled, so I never got a chance to find out what these meetings were all about. So a year after my husband's death, with more time than I care to have on my hands, I could now satisfy my curiosity. I went on the internet and found not one, but six listings for deaf cafes in Manhattan, located in three areas, Midtown, Upper West Side, and Downtown. The cafe in Midtown was quite expensive, $15 attendance fee with a limit of 25 people. Most, however, had no fees nor limit on attendance. Background information told me that deaf cafes had originated in Switzerland in 2004 with the idea of helping people make the most of their finite lives and break the secrecy surrounding death. I decided to attend one at the New York Society for Ethical Culture on the Upper West Side. My husband and I had gone there for many end-of-life lecture series sponsored by Compassion and Choices. All were very helpful with great guest speakers. The Death Cafe at the Ethical Culture Society would be hosted by Reverend Beverly Sampson. The suggested donation of $5 was to cover the cost of tea and cake. It sounded cozy. Most of the cafes took place about twice a month, and this one started at 1.30 on a Sunday. I arrived early and was sent to a room on the second floor and began reading all the hand handouts. But shortly thereafter, I was not to be alone. A very large man, with straggly hair and beard going in all directions arrived. My husband would have loathed this man's appearance, since Brian was always well-groomed, keeping a short haircut and neatly trimmed beard. Consequently, I had the passing thought that old age does not excuse scruffiness. Hello, I'm John, said this large presence. Is this the room for the death cafe? 
Yes, I answered, and it was the last and only word I got to utter for 15 minutes. John was avidly interested in green burials and presently planning his own funeral. He told me he had already visited many beautiful natural sites in upstate New York and even New Jersey. He rambled on and on until I considered either leaving the room or granting his wish for a perfect immediate burial by killing him. I never did get a real understanding uh, of what green burials were, but I assumed a naked body without funereal frills would be dumped underground in a beautiful setting, thus putting an end to unspoiled, unsullied area. John shut up when two more people arrived, a man in his 70s and a woman about 50 or 60. They introduced themselves and apparently knew John the Scruffy. John had been there before, and when Dr. Sampson arrived, the moderator of the event, he commented on her outfit. She was wearing a pretty blouse with the words sparkle on it, another warning sign that I should leave immediately. <laughs> But maybe Sparkle referred to her personality and was not a directive to us. I decided to give her a chance since she was bearing food, a nice looking tea cake, cheese and crackers. She did indeed sparkle, making enthusiastic noises as she de detailed every minute ingredient of the tea cake. She had made it that morning, she enthused, and it was still warm. After she finished the accolades for the cake, she introduced herself to me since I was apparently the only new person in the group. <clears throat> it turned out she was from Manchester, England, a place I knew quite well since Brian had brought me there early in our marriage. He had lived there in his youth and attended one of the schools. The Reverend started the discussion <clears throat> by asking us what kind of funerals we would like. I had hoped the discussions would be about living wills and healthcare proxies, documents which should precede funeral arrangements. However, I conceded that maybe these topics had already been covered. Unfortunately, John the Scruffy again began talking incessantly while he distributed all kinds of brochures. The Reverend was finally able to cut him short and call on another man named Jim. Jim said, he was an Irish Catholic and asked if he looked Jewish. At this point, I almost interjected, look, all old people look alike. <laughs> Before Dr. Sampson, had, Dr. Sampson had completely lost control of directing the, the discussion, but was able to mention her own friends and how they had planned glorious parades, concerts, and all kinds of crazy memorials that they wanted after they died. After Jim was convinced that he looked the way he wanted people to see him, he began talking about his horrific childhood, during which his father and his brother took turns beating him with a belt. If I survived that, I could survive anything, he said, no doubt looking forward to living forever. He then launched into a tirade about how he wanted to meet someone who was as spontaneous a talker as he was. He didn't care what people thought about his conversation. He just wanted to be spontaneous. Again, I could hear my erudite, brilliant husband now whispering in my ear, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> With this question still ringing in my ears, I suddenly asked Jim if his spontaneity wasn't basically an affront to another person in being their so-called space. I explained my question by pointing out that in New England, where I grew up, you talked only about the weather and would never dream about discussing your personal life or asking anyone about theirs. I told him it was not unlike England, the mother country itself, where personal affairs were your own business. At this point, I awakened Dr. Sampson's early roots. Oh, how true, how true. Spontaneity is not good manners in England. That subdued Jim for a while. And I was able to inquire about the other woman in attendance. I asked her if she would tell us about herself. My name is Gail, she said, not spelled G-A-L-E, like that woman in the old TV series called Gail Storm. My name is spelled with an I. 
Gailwood and I, in her name, was a nurse who had spent many years in hospital ICUs. She agreed with me when I said that doctors in hospitals are somewhat hypocritical in not believing in physician-assisted deaths since they were already killing patients with morphine and other dr drugs when they were in pain. Well, she told us that in the 1970s, the hospitals were uh, really torture chambers, keeping patients alive using all kinds of artificial means, but now the medical profession had changed with the concepts of palliative care and comfort care. After Gail had her say, say the clock struck 3 p.m., and the Reverend announced it was time to end our se session. We had to link hands and recite who knows what, some adage, either religious or uplifting, uplifting about the light above. I was prepared for this, however, since many grievance support groups that I have attended seem to end with banal, useless utterances which make you very happy to return to the deathly silence of your own home. This is uh, about Jacob the Russian shoemaker. I don't quite remember how I stumbled into Jacob's shoe repair shop located on DeGraw Street, just west of Court Street probably because it's located about a block away from the Seoul Korean tailor shop that I frequent. When I needed my shoes repaired, or as was more often the case, to have taps affixed or replaced, I would bring them to Jacob's shop, often do some errands, then go back to Jacob's shop and pick them up. Over the last 15 years or so, I got to know him and to like him very well. Jacob is a short, lean, wiry man and appears to be quite fit. He talks in a surprisingly deep voice with a strong Russian accent. He favored wearing flannel shirts under his work apron and had a tattoo, now faded with age, on his right forearm. Often we chatted about the events of the day, the weather, and things like that while we waited for the glue to set before he hammered in the nails to secure the taps. None of the other uh, neighborhood shoemakers, also mostly Russians, bothered to go through the gluing process. Jacob took pride in his work and didn't cut corners, so I went to him for all my shoe repairs. Recently, we got onto the subject of the Russian language. He regaled me about his granddaughter, of whom he was so proud. He said she was working on her PhD in Russian linguistics, I think at NYU. A surprising fact, he told me, and that his granddaughter had told him, was that about every third word in the Russian language has some association to Hebrew, or some origins in Hebrew or that they both had common roots. I still don't know if that, in fact, is true, but I was intrigued. One day I'll research it, maybe. Several months ago, when I visited his shop, he offered me tea and toast that was rather burnt while we were waiting for the glue to set before hammering in the taps. More recently, I noticed that three pairs of my shoes needed taps to be replaced. Uh, I took, I put them in a bag on one Saturday morning and I brought them to his shop, expecting to leave them there to be repaired and then to, to pick them up after I'd done some uh, errands. As I approached the shop, I saw a sign in the window. It read, business closed. I was shocked. Quite often, when business is closed, there's a, a sign that reads something like, after 35 years, I'm retiring, going fishing, thanks for your patronage, or something like that. Not this sign. It reads, it read, business closed. I just stood there and imagined the worst. About three or four years ago, I remember uh, him saying, I feel like I'm getting old. I'm 72. How much longer can I go on working like this? I said to him, 
keeping working is probably the best thing you can do. I remember reading that people who continue to work, particularly those who exert energy moving their arms and hands, such as uh, orchestra conductors, pianists, tend to live long. I imagine the same underlying principle would apply to shoemakers as well. As I was telling him that, I was trying to convince myself of that also, as I was about 76 at the time. Anyway, I walked up and looked into the uh, store window for any clues that might have a, as to what might have happened to Jacob. Looking in, I saw the store was empty and in shambles. A chair was turned over, and there was an empty space where once stood a counter. Newspapers and, magazine, newspapers and magazines were strewn on the floor. All the machines and, uh, and tools were gone, as was the miscellany of m merchandise he carried. Shoe polish, dyes, belts, brushes, shoe horns, stuff like that. Nothing was there. One thing, however, did catch my attention. In the window hung a little girl's dress, probably from the dressmaker's shop next door. Could it be that she will be taking over his space? And if so, perhaps she knew what happened to Jacob. But her store was closed. Curiosity got the better of me. Whenever I was nearby, I made several attempts to, to find out what happened to him from the dressmaker next door. My first two attempts failed, store closed. Then about a week later, she was there, a rather large, middle-aged, Italian-looking woman. She was sitting in the doorway, blocking the entrance, and was talking on the phone. I just waited. When she finally looked up at me, she said, I'm talking to my friend, and I'll be a while. So what is it? <laughs> when I asked her about Jacob, she said, all I can tell you is that Jacob is all right. He finally decided to, to close the store and retire. Then she returned to her phone. From the way she handled my question, practically anticipating it, it sounded like I was not the only person to have asked her what became of Jacob. I couldn't help thinking at the time that perhaps the burnt toast we shared at our last encounter was an omen signifying the end of my acquaintanceship with Jacob. That's it. This piece is entitled Michael. I met Michael when I started working in the advertising department of Gert's store in Jamaica, Queens, soon after graduating from college. He and I were both gophers, pasting up ads in the big scrapbooks used for reference by the art and copy people, running the next day's ads to the buyers for their OKs, that sort of thing. It was supposed to be the track to the exalted status of copywriter beginning with ads for the pet shop and its dog grooming and flea powder and other pet supplies. However, our advertising director, Mr. Behrens, was no respecter of precedent. He once hired the daughter of the production head of the Long Island Press when I was next in line for a copy job. Michael was also passed over by someone the boss felt would burnish his image, such as it was. Oh. And each year, Mr. Behrens used to send Christmas cards with a photo of himself and his unprepossessing looking family, including their cat, to all of us for keepsakes. I would guess I probably didn't like Michael at first because he was so poker faced. When I encounter strange dogs, I like them to wag their tails vigorously to signal goodwill and people to fly their colors straight away and not play their cards close to the vest. Michael tucked his chin in and turned his head slightly when he made one of his terse acerbic comments under his breath. 
Stocky and barrel-chested, he walked springily on the balls of his feet, like a sailor. His rather large head, with close-cropped, dark, blonde hair, was Nazi-like, although he was Jewish. His most arresting feature were his pale blue eyes with thick, half-closed lids, like those of the cartoon cat Garfield. We soon became fast friends. Michael was ingenious in thinking up ways to extract the most pleasure from an otherwise menial and boring job. In the mornings, we cut out complete sets of the previous day's ads from the newspapers to be tacked up in the display cases in the elevator courts. He'd assign me my floors. <coughs> then we'd each take part half the head. <laughs> <laughs> Then we'd each take half of the ads, along with o ad OK releases, to be taken to the buyers. The goal was to see who could finish first and make it to the basement coffee shop. I would loaf through the store, doing broken field running around large lady shoppers with their commodious reticules. When I arrived gasping in the basement, there would be Michael, perched on a stool at the counter, nonchalantly smoking. One was allowed to smoke in public places back then. Can you imagine? In warm weather, he'd have somehow pinched two beach chairs from display department and put them behind a brick parapet on the roof of the store where we would sun ourselves, weather permitting. After synchronizing our watches, he'd give me precise instructions about which door I should take so as not to attract attention, going out on the roof together at that hour of the morning. Sometimes we would rendezvous in the coffee shop nearby, even though we weren't supposed to leave the store. He knew the proprietor of a men's haberdashery on the side street and shopped there a lot. Want to see a neat sweater I've got five bucks down on? He'd ask rhetorically. Of course I would. I love to give my opinion on things. I still do. He'd tell me to meet him there in precisely 14 minutes. Occasionally, we'd have lunch on the grass in front of the old mansion in Kings Park. I realize now that all this fooling around helped keep our minds off the fact that our college educations had apparently amounted to nothing and probably never would. I was not romantically inclined towards Michael, nor he to me. We occasionally went on dates, though. He had a quirky mind with interests ranging from Wagner's ring cycle operas. I declined this cultural opportunity as it runs for a series of days, and I have short attention span, to the loony. I remember the two of us going to spy on Moondog, a blind eccentric wrapped in army blankets, playing his little flute in the darkened storefront somewhere in the garment district after hours. How he knew where Moondog would be, I cannot imagine. He saw me to my door late one night, and as I'd forgotten my key, I had to ring the bell. In his pajamas, my father, exceeding wroth, as they say in the Bible, flung open the door and blasted us with, this is positively an outrage, an outrage. Embarrassed by that performance, I tried to avoid Michael on Monday morning at work. I needn't have worried. He sought me out and burst into my miserable little cubby hole as soon as I got in, exclaiming, I want to thank you. What an experience in this day and age to hear that something I did qualified as an outrage. It was pure Henry James. <laughs> Once Michael took me to meet an artist friend named Joel. Joel was the first flower child I had ever met, and he lived in the village with his wife. We dropped in on them unexpectedly, and Joel decided to take a bath in the great ball and clawfoot tub, elevated on a two-foot-high platform in an alcove in the corner of the kitchen. We chatted with him as he bathed, 
and he kept calling out to his wife from behind the shower curtain for more and more toilet articles. Finally, he emerged wrapped in a big bath mat, and I was astonished to see he had shaved off his Charles Manson black mustache and beard for the occasion. We went for pizza at the famous Joe's, and when we sat down, there were two untouched slices of pie on the tray, which the previous group had left. Joel promptly ate them. His wife was embarrassed and scolded him. Afterwards, Michael didn't apologize to me for his friend's behavior, which I thought was nice. He said that in his opinion, Joel was a certified artistic genius. In what medium he worked, I don't know, as there were no signs of artistic endeavor to be seen in their little apartment. From what I did observe of him, however, Joel would surely require immense canvases like Christo's, subjects like Berlin's Reichstadt building wrapped in canvas, or miles of canyons flapping with curtains. More likely, his very life would be his magnum opus. Mr. Behrens hired the son of a friend for Michael to break in. Michael despised him on sight. The guy bragged about having a pylonidal cyst on the end of his spine that he wouldn't have lanced so that he could maintain his 4F status. Michael, whose older brother was in the Army Reserves, thought this loathsome. Damned if I'd go around with a carbuncle on my ass just to avoid the draft. The only cool thing about the cyst, as Michael took to calling the new guy, was that he expertly rolled his own cigarettes. Michael swore that the tiny explosions you could see in the tobacco he smoked were due to the horse manure in the chief blend, cheap blend he bought. Michael revealed his anxieties to me as I did to him, a sign of trust between the two low on the totem pole nudges we were. I still bit my nails back then, but he did too, but much worse, to the quick, wherever that is. He had been going on job interviews that went nowhere. You know, he observed wistfully, the minute they, the interviewers, see my hands, they have something on me. They think I'm nervous, fearful, neurotic, none of which I am. My Achilles fingernails. Michael told me an awful personal story one day. His mother was married to a Bayside dentist. And with too much time and money on her hands, she turned the full blast of her mothering on Michael. She would go to extraordinary lengths to get special grains fruits and proteins for him, and she policed every morsel he ate. He recalled a period in his early childhood when she began to stand him naked on the toilet seat and turning him this way and that, examine him intently. These perusals took place more frequently, and she was clearly becoming increasingly worried. His back had definitely become quite crooked. She had given him a neat case, as he wryly put it, of tuberculosis of the spine from the raw milk she got especially for him from God knows where. He spent a year in neck to crotch casts. He recounted this in his usual wry way and didn't appear to hold any animus against the woman. I think it was this long period as a child trapped in that plaster prison that gave him an incredible ability to say the funniest things in the fewest words. For instance, this, blind date last night, neat little mustache, great bridge player. What a torrent of impressions. He'd had a date with a girl who had a mustache and they played bridge. So it didn't surprise me in the least to learn that he became a book jacket writer for the prestigious publishing house Doubleday, giving readers the gist of an entire literary work in a handful of lines on the narrow strip of paper inside the front cover 
of the book. I just want to come by. I can only stay for maybe one other story, so I'm just gonna I'll stand over in the corner there. Um, but I just wanted to uh, uh, express how appreciative I am that you all uh, are participating in this really wonderful program. Um, uh, I'm very proud to be able to support it with council funds every year um, from the New York City Council to be able to support the, the, the programming. Um, that was a wonderful short story. The, the value of, of writing, I think, is so important um, as it translates our life experiences. I was, I'll just share this really quickly with you. I was just talking to my father, who's 75 years old the other day, but a rather dramatic experience a couple weekends ago. Uh, he was, in, he was in the Marine Corps, and he went to a reunion and uh, had a kind of um, sad interaction with, uh, with, with, a, with another 75-year-old former Marine, you know, about the uh, you know, issues of prejudice and, and, uh, and, and I think a lot of kind of life experiences, and it was, it was a, not, a, not, not pleasant, and he related to, to me in a very, you know, somber way. I haven't had a chance to talk to him but after, since then, but I, I, after thinking about it, I said, you know what, you should write, write about that. You should write that down. To, to be able to translate life experience into, into a way that is um, uh, you know, meaningful and, and distilled and imaginative and descriptive and um, in a way that you can share with others, I think is, is, is a great value. And so, um, I'm just pleased to be able to be here, and uh, thank you for having me. This is always a highlight for me every year to come and listen to a few stories. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Much. Hello, everyone. This, I have two pieces. The first one is called Moving to Florida. When I was about eight years old, the first seeds of childhood rebellion stirred within me. I told my mother that I was leaving home and going to Florida. Something my mother said inflamed me, my sense of justice. I don't remember what my mother said, but my nose was definitely out of joint. I still remember it and smiled at the audaciousness of it. Not only the audaciousness of the statement, but my total belief that I would make it to Florida if I kept on walking south. Technically, I had no idea which way was south. The details didn't bother me. I would get to Florida by walking down the driveway, making a right turn, and walking to the end of the block, which is not a far distance, and making a left turn. Then I would be magically on my way to Florida. This journey was my first big journey. The green case had traveled across the street for an overnight play date, but the move to Florida was the big one. Florida was Nirvana. Everyone seemed to be moving to Florida for a better life when I was young. After my declaration of independence, I went upstairs and took my little green overnight case and began to diligently pack my clothes. The job became very absorbing and must have had a zen-like effect on my anger. I couldn't even remember what I was angry about, but it was fun packing the suitcase. I loved my little green case. When I determined that I was finished, I proceeded downstairs and donned my plaid raincoat. I can still see the raincoat, which I think my mother handed to me at the front door. I proceeded down the front porch stairs with my head held high. At the end of the driveway, I paused. My mother, watching all this from the front door, called me and suggested that maybe I should go should do this another day because the weather was bad. I considered her suggestion, and maybe I should do this another day because the weather was bad. And I concurred that it was a good idea and turned back. I still have the image of my mother watching over my journey from the front door. And this is a second piece. It's called Manny. Manny sat on the stoop observing the world pass by. It is something he did with regularity now that he was retired. The June weather was seasonably warm and the heat soothed his bones, especially his knee. The doctors said the condition was, quote, bone on bone, unquote. What did that mean? 
All he knew was that his knee hurt with a painful frequency now, and he had good days and bad days. Manny's gait had become a shuffle, but he refused to use a cane. Looking at him, you would never guess that he had once been the Mambo champion of the Chili Pepper Lounge, but now those days were gone. Manny raised his face up to catch the last colors of the evening sky. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see his Mambo dancing competitor, Buddy, Carlos, approaching him. Carlos and Manny had a rivalry, rivalry over the years. He glanced at his stomach ruefully. Carlos often teased him about his belly that was beginning to hang over his belt. Carlos asked, how is your garden? Is anything growing yet? Manny replied, just started to get some to tomatoes, but they are not ripe yet. Come, let me show you. Manny, gesturing to Carlos, got up and shuffled over to his garden on the side of the house where he had etched out a space to grow some vegetables. Gardening was his new passion, now that he couldn't spend his nights mumbling. Manny proudly pointed to his pride and joy, his neatly tended small patch of garden. In the center was a vine standing tall and proud, covered with tiny yellow flowers, offering the promise of new tomatoes. At the top of the vine was one large green tomato, the first visible fruits of his labor. It wasn't just any tomato. It was Manny's first homegrown tomato. It would be a rough night in the graveyard. A new monument had been unveiled that morning, and the neighboring stones were all getting with delight to see and comment on their newly arrived companion and rank and file dignity. Myrtle Feigenbaum had been laid to rest a few months back, and the monuments nearby were anxious to know what her bereaved family had spent on her memorial. Whether it was wrought of granite or marble, or whether it had been chunked out of cheap sandstone whose features would dissolve in a few years and leave Myrtle's graces and glories unknown to the world. Whether its color and presence would fit in with the neighborhood and such like. A certain Chabad rabbi had counseled that the expressions used on one's monument should take into account the sensitivities of the surrounding stones. That these expressions should not stand out from their neighbors in ostentation. Perhaps this, was, this counsel on modesty was well placed or perhaps it would have made no difference amongst this lot of incorrigibles assembled behind the gates of perpetual peace. The gentle reader is knowledgeable, no doubt, of the sensitivities and delicate distresses of tombstones when they congregate in kibbutz amongst themselves after an unveiling, when day is done and visitors have gone home. Little introduction, little further introduction to the subject should be required. These petrous discussions always break out at night, once the gates have been closed and locked, and night draws its shades over the rolling acres of rolling acres of rolling acres of stone-studded necropolis. The living, innocent that they are, go about their appointed days under the sun in simple confidence that Eternal slumber will rule the peaceful precincts of the departed. And in great measure, this is a reasonable expectation. The departed themselves seems per seem perfectly content with their estate. It's left to their monuments to take up the struggles of those deposited below and under their watch. Myrtle, of course, was completely indifferent to the fuss of nocturnal discussion going on above her amongst the lapidary folks, as her ears had rotted off months ago. And besides that, who could care a flying flip about the hair below with all the sorrows and concerns for the vanities of marble and granite? Myrtle spent her time these days, and days are what you call these undulating stretches of blissful contentment relaxing on a soft feather bed of cloud, with her feet propped up on another smaller cloud, sifting, sifting from nectar served up in a 24-carat solid gold cup, 
born by an obliging seraph, personally assigned to her. There were always seraphim and cherubim at her beck and call these days to wait on her. No more washing and ironing, no more runny noses to wipe, no more dogs to walk. These heavenly hounds hereabout, bless their little hearts, walk themselves. And when they are done, they clean up after themselves and come over to head you and massage your ears. Of course, their droppings were all 24 karat pure gold. So, cleanup would be a pleasure, one would think. However, no one here cares a flying flip about such dread. There's no demand. Everything around here is 24 karat gold. Unless it be platinum or porphyry, pearl, carnelian, ruby, emerald, diamonds, whatever. Miami Beach and Rodeo Drive never saw the light. Well, perhaps a fur coat would be nice, thought Myrtle. But what with the perfect climate control, it would be a nuisance. And the gowns they issue here all shine with such an incandescent brilliance, it would be a shame to cover them up anyway. Small wonder then that Myrtle could not care please flip what the monuments of the boneyard below were up to under the, under the cover of night. As far as she was concerned, they could erect her a monument of cinder block and inscribe her initials on it with a nail, M F. And no, she had no desire to call home as her husband as much as her husband and children pined for her, not even to visit in his dream. What for? She was done with earth beauty. Examination and critical disputation in the, in the boneyard commenced no sooner than the visitors had left and dark had descended. In the light of the moon, a few sniffling and sniping comments started to be heard here and there. Perhaps the festoon on Myrtle's new stone could be a bit lower, you know? And was that a cracking surface or marble? Looks like something from Home Depot, suggested one wag, an impudent adolescent monument. Or maybe Lowe's Home Improvement Department, snickered his friend. The markers of Sophie and Zelda, never the best of friends in the best of times, now united in derision of the florid script that he dies in the Myrtle's memorial, had allowed that their own Times New Roman chiseling was more tasteful and elegant. This brought a comment from further afield, directed at Sophie and Zelda, which was, which was returned in time. This produced yet another unflattering rejoinder, which we shall not repeat here, out of decency. Well, at least my children come to visit me, someone shrieked from a distance. From another quarter was heard a reply to this, not exactly kind. Silence, commanded Mr. Bernstein from his flats, a few rows over. I'm supposed to be sleeping in the bosom of Abraham. And with all that racket going on over there, how am I to repose? I might as well have been buried in the middle of Yankee Stadium between innings. Mr. Bernstein was new to the cemetery, and his ears had not rotted off yet. In fact, he wasn't even completely dead yet. He was in a coma. But as his cult did not practice embalming, there would be no ouch reaction to the poke of a trocar had one been inserted into his tracks. And thus his cataleptic state had gone unnoticed, even through the funeral eulogies. What had not gone unnoticed, however, was the conduct of the mourners and the comments of his heirs. These latter ingrates he would deal with later, he decided. A pox on them all. May all the sweets of life turn to ashes in their mouth. We should like to report that these disputations remained isolated amongst the aforementioned protagonists. But alas, this was not the case. There came a taking up of sides and an escalation of charges and countercharges. Old gripes and complaints were sounded, repeated, and amplified. Mr. Bernstein's voice could no longer be heard over the den. Inevitably, the disagreements ignited further and farther and devolved into a Donnybrook of flung insults and curses. Then rocks and stones began to fly. 
First a few, like droplets at the beginning of a thunderstorm. Then wholesale showers and spates and salvos of projectiles of all descriptions. Stoneware, lapidaries, benches, rocks, clods of earth, clods and sod. The groundskeeper arrived unusually early before the curtain of night had been lifted. With the intention of retrieving a flask of bootleg liquor he had buried under the Merkel monument for safety. <laughs> I had to use it since it goes around a whole lot. He unlocked the gates, gasped, rubbed his eyes, then gasped again. His blurry eyes, for he had just come from an all night poker game, beheld a devastation beyond description. A sea of unbroken and toppled monuments, some lopped off at the base, others skewed and upend upended or cast afar off. Bushes and trees torn out and flung helter about helter and skelter. What in the name of Bales above happened here, he exclaimed. Then hiccup, then tottered, well nigh the thing. The only monument left upright was that of Myrtle Fighting Bow. Myrtle, did we mention? In life had been a black belt in karate. <laughs> Perhaps her power and will had been absorbed by her tombstone proxy. Our good man, the groundskeeper, blanched and fled back to the field house where he rang for help with frantic fingers of fumble. Hello, hello, Dunkin' Donuts. This is the gates of perpetual peace. Would you please send over a table full of cops? There has been <laughs> there, has, <laughs> there has been a horrible wholesale vandalism over here. I'm sorry, replied the manager. You'll have to wait your turn. There is a shift change in progress, and besides, the officers are still having their coffee. They'll drop by after breakfast. Shall I have them bring over a dozen donuts? There's a special today, 13 for the price of 12. <laughs> Will that be all? Clock. And so it was that well after daybreak, that three squad cars shot up to the cemetery, sirens ablaze and lights flashing. The cops screeched to a halt at the gates of perpetual peace, leaped out en masse, and assumed a pose. Their shoes freshly shined, flak jackets neatly pressed and guns drawn and pointing straight ahead at the Garden of the Dead. The groundskeeper unchanged, unchained the gates, and the forces of law and order poured in, pure power on display and in dead earnest. By the way, gentle reader, did you hear about the two maggots who were fighting in dead earnest? But we digress. And, he just didn't get it. <laughs> 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 well, <I> didn't get. <laughs> and there they froze. Instead of a battlefield resembling an exploded quarry, as, the, as purported by the agitated groundskeeper, the scene that met their gaze was one of bucolic tranquility, complete and divine perfect order. The dewdrops were lined up on the blades of, gla of grass each politely waiting its turn to drink. The willows sighed and wept gracefully. The ponds reflected the undisturbed tranquility of the skies above. Nary a lapidary, lapidary was out of place or touched with the slightest trace of alteration. All stood unmutated as if they had been planted thus at the beginning of eternity. A paradise of peace purple only by the breeze. And the officers left, taking the groundskeeper with them in handcuffs. The monuments all stared mutely at the departure, as if absorbed in timeless reverie. But deep in the brownian movement of the molecules of their miserable mineral bowels, they already were fought the next morning that would break out the making the darkness of nightfall, when mortal witnesses were safely asleep in their own. To hold or not to hold. She could not for the life of her remember what she had done on Saturday. 
She may have cleaned a few closets or ruffled through a drawer in her bedroom. She began to think how she viewed her collections as attachments, burdens, reminders of experiences or categories of life steps. It seemed that if they were viewed as items that were useful, still good, uh, worn, but not worn out, it might help her deal with all of them. Then there were the sentimental objects, those with a memorial aesthetic attached to them. They were seashells and pine cones, farm tools, hobby boxes, feathers, big and small, clods of clay found on a riverbed, material, cotton, lace, denim. These collections were reminders of a special place and of projects unfinished or never began. Among the collections around her, there were items that had a particular heaviness. Her recently deceased husband's baseball cards, never out of the box, baseballs caught at Yankee Stadium when he could sneak under the fence. Some were signed by the team, some had other stories. She strived to remember the details told enthusiastically peppered with names like Red Barber and Mickey Mantle. Then there was the Scrimshaw set, a most exotic item. She thought of her husband as a sailor, spending his idle time at this exotic hobby. He had, after all, tried to join the Navy, going down to the recruiting office, hiding the fact from his mother, who cried as he came home with the news that it was his diabetes that had prevented him from enlisting. Other random pieces, Navajo pottery, teacups from Ireland, would stay in place on the shelves. He had called them his treasured possessions. Another category might be considered, the things he played with, his ties and tie tacks. He did take pride in wearing a great looking tie choosing carefully each day of the 37 years he had worked on Wall Street. Friends had suggested that she make a quilt with them. No, they were not to be dismantled. It struck her that one should live with memories for a while, to hold them. And so when the fishing gear, the lures and hooks and the canvas satchels to carry them popped out of closet corners or fall from a shelf, she thought that she would consider, oh, she would, oh, that she, she should spend a moment, a short minute, with pleasant thoughts of her fisherman husband walking the beaches with his fishing rod bringing home fluke or flounder, and the satisfying meal that followed. She thought back to her own youth, when she held her own attachments. Things seemed more orderly then. Comics had their place on the front porch, dolls in their wicker carriage, and rocks in a cigar box on the windowsill. Her mother's notions had a place in the Singer's sewing machine. She called she recalled archival collections she had seen as a teen on a visit to the town historian, newspaper clippings, town records, photographs. That was another type of collection meant to hold a history. She wondered how she had gotten interested in collections at all. As the middle child of seven, was she meant to be the family archivist, the historian, the one who would hold on to these things. She had been the one most curious about what was in her father's tool chest, a great wooden chest with many compartments that held all sorts of tools, pieces of farm machinery and hardware. She too was drawn to her mother's cedar chest, the scent wafting through the air as its top was lifted. It was, it seemed, the treasure chest and the nicest piece of furniture in the house, holding her mother's creamy silk wedding dress, an unfinished quilt 
and some postcards from the petrified forest of Arizona. It seemed that everything she had to do with, she had had to do with collections. To hold or not to hold them was the question. Had Saturday been a nicer day, she might have gone out to a museum to see their collections or gone out to lunch with a friend to an ethnic restaurant with collections of spices near the register or visited a friend who lives in a brownstone where she displays her mother's dishes and paintings. Or she may have called to comfort a friend who was piecing together her mother's life as she so slowly presented her with items her mother no longer recognized. No, she must have stayed at home and ruffled through her own closets because there was a small bag at the door with a few items she was holding for someone else. Uh, I'm just going to read a very short piece. Uh, it's a book called The Dementia Diaries, which is a tribute to my, uh, my mother that I have written. I'm going to read the preface. I guess I'll say it. All right. It's about my mother's 90th birthday party. <clears throat> my mother's birthday dinner at John Doe on the Water in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, would be a small gathering of friends and relatives, including George Clooney. That is a poster of George Clooney. The Japanese tourists who were real, who were real, came later, snapping pictures before they found their tables. They were happy and mistook us, or did they, for a tourist attraction. My mother loved it. Ninety, she kept saying. Ninety. I can't believe that number, she kept repeating. So we purposely didn't put it on the cake. One elderly Japanese gentleman knew, though, because my sister-in-law speaks Japanese, and probably told him because there seemed to be a fresh commotion a ripple of excitement among their tables. My mother liked this. The old man came over, kissed her on the cheek, and then took her picture. Could she have found love again so suddenly with the Japanese tourist at Jando in the water? Not exactly, since his wife was there too, and the both of them soon stood side by side, inviting my mother to stay with them in Japan. Within days, no doubt, Japan would know all about this. That is, about my mother turning 90. My mother loves attention, and on this night she got it. I, I felt bad at first I couldn't afford to make her one of those big birthday bashes like some of her relatives or friends' children might, you know, inviting 300 of her closest friends, rent out the whole restaurant or a cruise ship on the Hudson, the Danube, or the Intercoastal down in Florida. I felt out of it. It was really my cousin Marilyn and our very close friend Joni who found the place and planned it all and even helped pay for it. Then my cousin asked people to chip in on a gift, even me. So where was my gift? Chipping in, showing up, was that enough? Where was I in all this, her own son? What could I give my mother that no one else could and without having to spend a lot of money? Then my wife told me I should write a poem for my mother and read it at the restaurant. I still didn't feel that writing a poem would make up for not paying for all this and more, but I decided to write one anyway. And when the night arrived, sometime after my second or third drink, I read it to her and everyone else at the table. She couldn't be 90. I mean, isn't that too old to still look like Marilyn Monroe? She doesn't look 90, maybe 60. Still floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee. And if she falls, she gets up like Muhammad Ali, who, by the way, is only 70. She doesn't need assisted living or home care, she says. Let them put on their own underwear. She loves to watch Piers Morgan and Bill Maher, but most of all, on her refrigerated door, for all of Coconut Creek to see, is a picture of her boyfriend, George Clooney. So she can't be nice, can she? Her face is so smooth. She's really very clever. You can never pull a fast one on her, ever. So Laura, tonight we pour a glass for you, with all our love and appreciation, screw the medication, spill it all down the sink, and let's just drink, drink, drink to you. If we searched the whole world through and found all kinds of others, we'd never find another mother or aunt or grandma like you. 
My mother loved it. She thanked me. Despite all the times I mentioned she was 90, she still thanked me. That was lovely, she said. Thank you. That was really lovely. I never really remembered my mother thanking me for much of anything. I mean, I never thanked her for much either. We just weren't a family who thanked each other for much. We never told each other that we loved each other. These things were just too hard to say, to do. Spending money was much easier, theoretically, of course. So when my mother thanked me for the poem, I felt she had given me a gift as well. She said that she would put it on her refrigerator in Florida next to George Clooney. And that was good enough for me. The night was a success. Everyone had a good time. My mother was beaming. When she walked out of the restaurant, she really did look like Marilyn Monroe during a movie premiere, basking in the present, uncertain of the future. And when she was whisked away in someone's car, clutching her rolled up poster of George Clooney, we paparazzi still taking pictures. I suddenly felt very wealthy and hoped more than anything, my mother would always remember this night, the night she turned 90 and took George Clooney home. Thank you. So, There are a few other uh, sections in here on George Clooney, but you have to buy the book in order to read them. So, uh, anyway, I think I'll stand for this. Thank you so much for coming, and, and please a, a round of applause for our great, great readers. <laughs>